But Cal, how are you organizing your digital health teams, whether it be developers or regulatory leads, sales and marketing, to be able to achieve this bottom line commercial success? Yeah, let me, uh, let me take that question from obviously uh, at Bright Insight and Flex, where we have to work across uh, you know, a range of customers and what we're seeing, you know, our, our biopharma and, and med tech folks do. And maybe what I'll point is to a model that we believe is, is uh, one that's most successful, and that's where you look at combining that, those capabilities really into a business unit oriented around digitizing, commercializing, and driving pull through of your digital based products. Um, this space, to, from, from my vantage point, this space is, as we've talked all day today, too new, too complex to have it be run by a thousand different people across a hundred different departments. So you have to say, I need regulatory, I need legal, I need privacy. I need um, my product people, I need my software IT people, um, I need my uh, commercialization people, et cetera, all under one team with one set, of one set of incentives to go and actually build, commercialize, and drive value to your products. Otherwise, you're never going to make a decision. You're going to have a lot of people who are incentivized to say no. Uh, and you're going to have a lot of people who, frankly, don't have enough time to really deeply understand that space, whether it's from regulatory, legal, et cetera to really appropriately provide the guidance to commercialize and do that at any sort of pace that, that you need to in digital. You know, that's, uh, we, we began the morning, you will recall, with Diana's presentation around the role of the CIO. And, 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 and Diana uh, uh, and, and, uh, you know, started to get into this notion of at what point is the CIO the locus, the nidus, to drive change and whether the CIO's responsibility is to bring and educate others. And I think what you're sort of saying, and of course, Bright Insight is a unique model, what you're sort of saying is that uh, in this particular company, you've, you've got, it's not the CIO per se that's leading the change, it's everybody sort of harnessing together around a common vision. Yeah, yeah. and common set of incentives, right? Yeah. Great. Um, let me uh, take that same uh, question to you, Sam. Um, you know, uh, you are a senior partner and managing director at Boston Consulting Group. What, what are you focused most on with your customers uh, as you try to help them to understand how do you take these exciting ideas, um, and we, we, we used the term in the last panel, you know, innovation for innovation's sake is really not particularly great, but um, um, how do we um, uh, turn that innovation, that excitement of ideas into sure. bottom line results? Yeah, and. Uh I do want to give a little background to understand the context for my answer. Sure. I've actually been on both sides of it. Uh, before joining BCG, I was actually the CEO of a direct-to-patient company set up on behalf of pharma to sort of innovate their commercial model. Uh, uh, there just hadn't been a lot of innovation on how you engage customers directly. So I built that business. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thriving. I managed to uh, then exit out of it. And now, uh, I work with uh, uh, Biopharma and their customers on how to fundamentally transform the, uh, the commercial model. So I'm going to talk about it in that context. At the very, and I want to allude to what you said at the very beginning, which is that pharma is not used to uh, the kind of agile Silicon Valley style product development. right? But there's something interesting about that product development process, which is there's some innovation research. But then there's this translational effort of having a protected environment to do experiments on real patients to see whether it works before you commercialize it. Mm -hmm. But there's no such thing for digital innovation, right? Uh, for, for innovating on the business model itself, right? So in some ways, there is something to be learned from the traditional aspect of pharma, which is can you create that space because just building digital solutions doesn't change anything. You have to essentially reinvent the engagement of how the go-to-market works with medical centers around uh, not just solutions, right? But on uh, traditionally, the model has been around using uh, data like script data, which is a little bit of a lagging indicator. We now have the insights to essentially work off of leading indicators, which patients should be on the right treatment at what time. We can predict that with great accuracy, increasing accuracy, right? So if you know that, how do you fundamentally change your, your commercial model? Right? How do you give your customers the tools 
on how to help them sort of manage it in the disease areas that you're working. A little bit like category management. But it's not about the technology. So you come back, so bring, let me bring it all back, yeah, good, right? Good. That the issue is that you need that same engine, which is when you have these ideas, you need a place, a safe harbor, a translational element to execute in the new way using the digital tools. And when I say execute, it's not just the internal pharma go to market, but it's how they're engaging with medical centers and payers and everything else. Right. So what's that safe harbor? I mean, what, what would that look like? So what it looks like is, and you know, uh, Cal and I are in the, uh, in the midst of uh, something like this right now, but you sort of, let's say you create a, let's say a patient journey management toolkit that you want to provide to uh, health systems that helps them identify patients sooner, get them on treatment, and make sure that they are getting the full value and experience and touching them outside of facilities, right? So the way we set that up is we actually uh, take two or three uh, health systems and create that same experimental protocol that we would have as if pharma was paying them to do uh, RCTs. But what we're doing is trying out a new way of engaging with digital, right? And it makes it much easier for the health systems to engage because now it's not about, sometimes they feel a little dirty taking money from pharma to get, to provide data, but the model for doing clinical research is well established. It's, it's you know, it's, so we're just trying to reframe it that, you know, that you could use that same model for digital and it works really well, right? And it's a win-win-win. I'm gonna come back to that. Yichel, how do I say your name? It was perfectly. Why, God, Yichel, I did it. Uh, you are the global head of digital health for Teva Pharmaceuticals. I, I think embedded in part of what we just heard from Sam is, and, I, and we've been sort of dancing around this all day, is, in your sense, the digital wraparound integrated solution with the pharmaceutical product is that a new product? Is that a new thing of itself? Or is it still needs to be viewed, do we still view this as there is a molecule, there are these other services, and they're sort of connected, but it's, but I'm still going to market as two different, one is like adding a little juice on top of the other as opposed to it's so embedded that it's a new thing. Yeah. So it's, it's not a, a straightforward answer. Um, I, I, we try to simplify it as much as possible. So in the end, when we look at the business and the bottom line uh, of how we're gonna generate uh, value out of uh, new connected and digital uh, uh, services around the drugs, we try to simplify it for the, uh, to the end user and to the payer. So in the end, we try to create something that can be used and can be paid same way that currently we get reimbursed for medications and same way that a, a, a patient is going to the pharmacy and get their prescription. So at the end, we, we realize that we're trying to be as much as possible um, kind of um, as part of the current journey when it's come both to the patient, the doctor, the pair. So get paid the same way, get consumed the same way. Uh, so in this aspect, we are very much trying to uh, bundle it as almost as a drug. Uh, but when it comes to uh, creating the value and understand what we can do with it and how we can benefit the patient, how we can create a different part of the value chain, we are looking at it completely as a new, a new drug or a new system in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in our portfolio. So we are building it really as a new, almost as a specialty portfolio asset, um, taking it in, into consideration from the whole process basically as a new, uh, uh, a new asset. We also look at it when we look at the, the whole portfolio as a new asset internally. We build a team as a new asset, but going to market very much the same as an as a, as a existing specialty drug that we are uh, uh, let me, let me Let me ask you to walk further down that road then. So would you ever envision as a business strategy um, that you go to the, to the purchaser, the plans, and you say, okay, I will uh, I will deliver, I'll, 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 I'll go at risk. I will say to you that I will guarantee you certain results 
whether it's compliance rates and with which therefore because the drug is a terrific drug if, they, if people are compliant therefore complications downstream will be less so if we do a total cost of care all in I want a different negotiation with you than what I had before would you ever see going to that place? absolutely yes so we are building the system and see the main value at the end exactly where you uh, uh, put it so we see this as a, as a as a solution that in the end is more than a drug that we more need to drug. have a, you know, years of, of proof in the chronic medications that can help. We believe that we will be able to show the benefits uh, much sooner and in real time. And as we have now the access and the pair have the access to this data, we'll be able to generate those kind of innovative agreements around risk, around share risk, share value, and so on. Uh, and this is one of the main uh, um, value that we eventually see in those, in those products. So we just to, Say, I mean, we no, are currently, on. yeah, we currently, we, this is when we developed the product, we started about four years ago with the current product that we just got approved a couple of months ago, focusing on respiratory diseases. When we started, we had a lot of expectations from the market to change during the next couple of years when we developed this uh, uh, portfolio. Unfortunately, and, and I'm sure it was discussed here, I mean, the payer system is mostly unready for this kind of, uh, of uh, 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 reimbursement uh, system. So we're very much trying to play, as I mentioned before, the game the same way that the, you know, the conservative uh, uh, industry is using and we just reimburse it as a new drug or a new improved drug in, for this asset. Uh, and as we move forward and we believe that we're going to be able to show the industry that there is a real value beyond this drug, we can then shift into another uh, uh, payment system that will take into consideration more risk uh, and value creation. Would, and I'll ask you and then Sam to respond um, as well. Would you ever be happy if there were standardized criteria to describe and prove this new value proposition that payers would use, that were predictable to you, that the payers would be able to implement without going on a case by case by case basis, slowing everything down, or would that be an anathema because what you're really looking for is complete, total differentiation, not only in the, in the offering, but in the evaluation of the offering? Start. Either yeah, one. Sure, I'll start. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there are some uh, uh, basic uh, parameters that are very much the same for uh, for those kind of risk uh, sharing agreement. If it's you know, eventually it's the cost, at least back it's the cost for uh, per patient, right? So, I mean, if we can show cost uh, improvement through either hospitalization, uh, visits to the hospital or doctors, utilization of the system, and so on, this is what we're all looking for. So, it's very basic for I believe most of the risk uh, uh, value. Uh, um, agreements. Then you look at uh, disease by disease, right? So some diseases you can you be able to show some other benefits, but I think in the end it's only to come to the cost because as you know the previous uh, uh, presentation just spoke. I mean, in the end is you know what's the what's the margins, what's the what's the arbitrage that you can create uh, for those uh, systems. So I think the parameters again, it's all, always going to come to cost of the patient. How you're going to create it, it very much depends on the specific disease. Good. Yeah, so I think, I, I personally think that there would be value um, in having a, a more standardized approach, but I think we're far away from it. You know, the, the, the reason being not that, you know, for example, in the past we've had, you know, we're, we still have experiments on value-based pricing, right? Part of the reason is that um, within the payer environment, they're still going through an evolution of, so for example, a lot of the reintegration of the PBMs, essentially, which used to be managed as a cost category, now we're saying, you know, can we manage total cost, right? So the journey is still underway. Right? Mm -hmm. So before you can jump to the part around having a standardized way, we almost have to sort of let some of this unfold, which is how do we come to grips with total cost that there is a way to make the case of spending here to capture value there, right? And that there's measurable ways around it. So there's a lot of infrastructure elements to it, yeah. which I see being built up, right? Yeah. And at some point, we'll get to the methodological standardization associated with it, but I don't think we're there yet. So I'm gonna ask you a question and have Cal uh, uh, respond. Um, you mentioned clinical research, and I'm, and I'm trying to think about that. So somehow or another, through the course of 
the early stages of implementation, there has to be the ability to see effect, quality outcome, safety, and also be able to try to track total cost of care across the, the, the spectrum. Biofarm and med tech companies may not, especially smaller ones, may have a challenge with some of the, the, the of, of what it takes to be able to produce the data to make the point that allows them to be able to say, I produce the value. Any thoughts on how that might happen? And then, Cal, I would imagine that this may be a, a, an opportunity downstream for you all at Bright Insight. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, on, in terms of, um, uh, so this notion of total value, that's not yet uh, a, uh, an endpoint of clinical trials, right? So, we need to figure out a way to sort of make that be a more standard part of the conversation. Um, and uh, can you build it into? I guess what I'm sort of pushing, I'm wondering, is is it? Do we need a new model of clinical trials that starts from the very beginning, collecting the data from, 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 from the first step that's, that's, an, that's a t an, an anticipating where you're trying to go? So I would actually flip it around. So right now it's an open loop model, right? We got some interesting science over here, and then we keep pushing it out, and there's always this bias to sort of press to the next. And then at some point we throw it over to sort of the payer marketing folks and says, go sell this, right? when uh, part of some of the th work that I've done with a client is basically say that uh, let's create you know, this notion of payer evidence, right? So just like you have regulatory uh, approvals, let's, let's think about what it, what's the value to a payer right up front. So let's, bring, let's design our product. Let's design the clinical trial. And sometimes not even a clinical trial. Let's design agile evidence generation. To sort of bring it up. I mean, just recently, I think there was this example of Pfizer was able to get label approval on eye brands for male breast cancer. There aren't enough people for there to be sort of a real clinical trial, and so they were able to sort of do that. I've seen a lot of clinical trials which actually fail in the later stages, not because of a clinical failure, but because we figured out there wasn't the right market for it. Right? Uh, Getting those considerations up front, yeah. talking, you know, it's like airlines go to their launch customers and say, what would you like, right? Now, I'm not saying we get there right away, uh -huh. but I think this engagement of pharma with payers as to where are the unmet needs, what is the value, and how do we generate the evidence in a way that you're ready to pay for it? Because more often than not, clinical trials get you past the regulators. It doesn't get you past... That's, the exactly, payers. that's exactly, right. so you almost sort of think of it as that we, we, we now go towards here to get to FDA, then you start over from FDA to plan. Yeah. Is can you start envisioning a curve that goes straight through right. all Make the it way? Right, you know? Yeah. Launch with a minimum viable that yeah. is approved and is safety, you know, in some ways that's minimum viable, right? And then Silicon Valley like add evidence based on yeah. some trials and some virtual trials and some real world evidence and real world use. Looks like you both of you want to get it. Yeah, so, go ahead. So I think this is great. I mean, so you know, one of the things we learn uh, in Teva and what we're doing now is we, with the new product, we basically have almost three parallel uh, uh, workforces to use the digital product. So one is very much clinical studies, classic clinical studies trying to show benefit of outcome, clinical outcome, and so on. We have another uh, uh, workforce that is exactly what I just mentioned. It, those are small, almost commercial pilots with pairs to work with them on the value that we'll create for them. And those are like studies with the, with the pairs before we commercially launch the full product. Just to make sure that we can show them what is the uh, outcome when it comes to cost, when it comes to their benefit, patient satisfaction, and other markets that payers through there are looking in order to implement new uh, system. And the third, which is also very new for pharma companies, it's the whole how we are testing a new technology mm. in this pharma environment. So this is a whole new operation, a new, a new support system, a new interaction with the patients that we will need to have. So we test this as well in parallel to make sure that when we launch it fully commercially, we'll have this infrastructure in place as well. So those are kind of the three parallel levels that we're doing before we are fully commercialized the product in the market. Great. I love what these guys are saying. Um, 
I'm, I'm, this gives me hope that one day I'll be able to stop saying this, which is I've never met an industry that tries harder to know, know less about their customer base. <laughs> right? I mean, pharma and medtech historically has built internal walls to say, how do I not actually know what's going on with my product and how people use it in the real world, whether it works, whether the experience is good, whether they're having side effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They take a very rigid, narrow approach to that, especially post post. Uh, Launch, it's like, oh gosh, we got, you know, we got approved by the regulator, so let's stop learning because something bad might happen. And the examples that uh, both Yakil and Sam are giving, I think, are are fantastic because they're showing how how this will change, and and hopefully this change will come, you know, uh, you know, within the next coming years. And so, as you think about your capabilities yeah. uh, uh, here at Bright Insight. Um, are you in a position now, or are you having those conversations with your partners around starting this simultaneous collection of forward-looking data that starts to help them answer these kinds of questions? Yeah, so you know, as we talked about a little bit this morning, right, we, we're, we're that fundamental infrastructure that's collecting that data in a, in, a, in a compliant, which by definition means validated way. And we collect all the data at the edge. So we're not sort of, you don't have to pre-decide pre what data might or might not be interesting. So if we're collecting everything and pulling it back into the back-end cloud, then you can decide um, after the fact, you can figure out, gosh, we want to use it for R&D here to potentially find sub-segments that are better responders. You might be looking at over here to say, why did this population engage with our digital solution and the other population didn't? Can we understand how we can make better engagement out of, out of our solutions? Uh, you can use it for safety monitoring, et cetera, right? So I think it starts with fundamentally having infrastructure that collects all the relevant data and makes it accessible and usable in a compliant and validated way in the back end so that you're never limited by the set of questions you can ask later from how you started. That's reassuring because I've been you know, really worried about the small company. How do they do this? It just seemed overwhelming. How much uh, in y'all's world, um, in meaningful terms, is this movement now to, uh, we keep going back and forth between the words patient centricity and consumer engagement. However you focus, let's just use the word for this, consumer. How different in the last year and a half, two years, if at all, has there been now with this emergence of people talking about you've got to focus on the needs of the patient, the individual person? Um, is that still, de is that determinant yet or just interesting? Want me to go? No? So I think it's, it's changing, you know, part of the reason why I ended up creating this direct-to-patient company. But the drivers for that are, like, I think if you look 10 years ago, if you asked pharma, who's your customer, you would basically say a doctor, right? Like, if you yes. think about, you know, who, and when we say personalization of the customer, it was personalization of the interactions. If you talked about digital, it was, you know, digital sales aids, right? and digital ways of monitoring. And the data that we used was what scripts are the doctor writing, right? And if you incented your sales force, it was like based on that, right? So now, even, so there are a few drivers for change. A, we now have much more patient level data as opposed to doctor data, right? Uh, so we now know, right, which patient, what their journey looks like. Literally, you can now pull up a map in a certain disease area what is the patient flow? You know, which path, what second line, who succeed, who don't, how do they get repurposed, right? And so I think more and more uh, pharma companies are starting to come to grips with that, with that information and trying to figure out how to then translate that into uh, engagement with their customers. The simplest way for them is simply to say, can we use that for our key account management targeting and Salesforce? If we know where the latent demand is, then we can be more focused. But increasingly, it is how can you collaborate with payers and providers to make sure that the right patients are getting onto the right medication at the right time. And the biggest complicating factor is the notion of personalization, because all our systems are built around one size fits all, whether it's formularies, and so every exception needs a prior auth, right? Whether it's marketing, you know, it's one size sort of fits all. So that is the, that's the, if you think about the rewiring that people are starting to do in bits and pieces, which is how do we make this patient center, which is going to be a lot more personalized, right? And making sure that the formulary is, pers you know, like one person may do better on one medication, the other one on another. How do we make that happen? Right now, it's not easy. So 
at Teva, when you sort of, I mean, you must be nervous in the world now that, that is A, really, really focused on personalized medicine. The studies that tell us, you know, we know how many people are on drugs that shouldn't be on the drugs if we had more knowledge about the patient population. Greater specificity, so you have shrinking numbers of people that may be eligible or should be eligible for the intervention, um, which makes you know, your ROI calculation more complex and more challenging. Do you see this digital engagement as a way of helping to obviate some of those, that transition that's occurring, or is it unrelated? No, I think that we're actually in a very good place. I mean, especially my, my team, is, it's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to find those patients that can benefit more from a specific treatment. We can provide the data almost in real time if the patient actually uh, benefit from a medication or not. We can provide the same data for the doctors to make this decision. We, in at least one of the projects we're doing right now, is trying to take, to take one of the more expensive medications, the biologic medication for patients with severe asthma, and see if by having the information about how those treatments actually help the, the patient, for how long, and which patient benefit from which one of the specific drugs that exist today, we can really then benefit the patients first, and then the pair systems. So for me, as someone that introduced digital system, this is a fantastic place to be in, because this is what pairs are looking for, to, for today, to understand which drug they need to prescribe, especially as drugs become more and more expensive when it comes to personalized medicine. One more push on, on that for both, for, for, for any of you, um, as I'm looking to see what people have questions that they want to ask you. Um, do you ever envision that the kind of information you just suggested will go to the payer, would, would go to the clinician with a specific goal that says, I now see you two years from now really on the hook for value-based reimbursement. Your cost of care, total outcomes of care all in, is now driving your decisions around what drugs you prescribe and what you're doing so that your money is at stake for, uh, in a way that has never been before. Your reimbursement is taken away that's never been before. Therefore, my tools that I'm going to give you will actually make a meaningful difference in your ability to survive in a value-based reimbursement world. Is that too specific for goals for, for the kinds of ways you're thinking about digital engagement? So I would separate the, the healthcare provider, the doctors, uh, from the pair system behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are introducing more and more digital uh, solutions that are very specific to a disease and can show a real benefit for the outcome, for the clinical outcome, uh, we see a lot of enthusiasm from the physicians, a lot. It's very clear to them that the, they, this will help them to provide a better medication, a better, a better help for the, for, for, the, for the patients, and for them, a much more objective information when they're treating those patients. So it's very easy kind of when the sell point, when we show them the benefit that they can see, and when we show them that the potential in the future using this data, how we can show them a more severe patient, or allocate a patient that can benefit from a specific treatment, the, this is a very easy sell when it comes to the doctor. When it comes to a more kind of a value-based agreement, this is, what, this is our sell point for the payers. Uh, and and we, are, we basically have a different you know, value that we provide for different parts of this value chain. So I'm, I, I wouldn't kind of mix them together, the value that the doctor see and the value that the payer can see, but de definitely going back to the previous question, when we develop a product or a system around the product, we are trying to look at the different value that we can then go out and sell the same way we sold before, if it's a value for a doctor with the clinical outcome, for the payer with a better uh, uh, outcome when it comes to the, uh, to the cost, and of always focus on the patient because I believe that now doctors and peers realize that the what we call digital is not just about having those benefit, but also retention of a patient, satisfaction of a yes, patient, yes. having a patient that understand the value now and not just taking the medication on based on what the doctor has told them. So it's a new kind of value that they can bring that increase their outcome in the end. So it, there is different value and we use it in different parts of the value chain. So moving from the plan to the doc, let's go back, Sam, to the patient. Do, what do patients want really here? I mean, are we... Um, are we building something that we, that sounds cool, but the people, what, what do they really want? 
Well, most patients would prefer not to be patients, <laughs> first of all. Um, it, 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 it's interesting um, that uh, there's a health system that I work with and we're spending time really talking to uh, the, the, the patients and you know, really asking them sort of what it is. And in some ways, they still will prioritize sort of the clinical outcome, right? So the experience can be completely shitty, but if you're gonna be, you know, if you're gonna be, get better from cancer, or survive and stuff like that, that's still priority number one. But once you sort of get beyond that, I think um, uh, the experience is, uh, you know, most, most patients would say that, you know, this, uh, this experience is so completely different from every other aspect of my life, yeah. right? Why is it? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so they are looking for, so if you can provide better outcomes with sort of the experience, it's not either or, right? So, I mean, I guess it, it, at some point, do we ever get for a, and again, moving from the consumer where you're trying to promote health and prevent disease to actual a patient. But can you ever get the digital solutions outside of the health ghetto so that it becomes part of just life? I guess what I'm, you know, so it becomes, it's, it's just, it's, it's seamless. I use my, let's say you have a, an Apple Watch mm -hmm. and you're using it and it tells you when to stand, but it also gives you other things, tells you when, you know, you have wakes up things, you, you have note taken on it. I mean, you've got all these kind of things that it does. At some point, does the, I, I remember being once at a, 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 I was at a meeting, a conference, it, it was, um, and I had a big break in between, and I decided I wanted to get some coffee. This is years ago, and, I, and it finally hit, this is when it all hit me. I, I wanted to get some coffee, so I, the app told me how to walk to the Starbucks. Okay, so I'm walking to the Starbucks. <laughs> and I get to the Starbucks, and I push something that tells me the nutritional content of what's in the Starbucks. While I'm waiting in the Starbucks, they have this terrific music playing. Man, I'm just like grooving and so forth. And like I'm saying, wow, I down, and I can actually identify the song. And then I push another thing and it says, you can buy the song. So I bought the song. Then I walked <laughs> back with the map to my hotel, had my conference call, went down to the gym, put on my new song, worked out like crazy. My heart weight went way up. And I, at the end of it, I kept saying to myself, what part of this was health? It was just living. I was just living my life. And I wound up doing something called health. Do we ever get to a point where the digital tools are so seamlessly embedded in our life that it, it doesn't become a ghetto? This is a dumb question, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, it's a great question. I'll get it started, but then hopefully others can help me out here. I think, I think uh, here we might have to look at some other markets. Uh, if you actually look at uh, the healthcare infrastructure, let's let's take China and India, right? In some ways, they're so far behind in terms of the existing physical infrastructure that increasingly, you know, health is being built into the the internet platforms, right? WeChat has partnered with Babylon, which is an NHS thing, right? Uh, in India, uh, one of the largest telcos is essentially creating a version of uh, a chat bot to say, I want a doctor's appointment or I'm not feeling well, uh, who do I connect to? Which, and it'll either connect to a doctor or to a pharmacy or it'll do you know, something else, right? So it becomes like having an Alexa, right? So there is a company that uh, I'm just buying because uh, we, we're, uh, we have a stake in it. It's called the Bright MD, which is a virtual physician assistant. If you think about the experience today, I want to make a, 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 an appointment. I get on, I talk to someone and get an appointment. When I show up, I'm given a clipboard you know, with a paper to sign stuff and fill in more information that I provided every time I sort of go there. Then I see the doctor. The doctor says, well, it'd be good if I sort of had a test. Then you go off and do a test, and then you come back and take a look at the test, right? So what this company does is essentially says, you know, you're sitting at home and say, I'm not feeling well. Well, uh, you, do I need to see a doctor? And, Basically, through a chatbot-like thing, it actually pre-fills the, you know, it does the baseline information, the diagnostic codes, and the order sets, and then a physician can say, yes, I don't want to see them, or actually would prefer to sort of have the test happen. So there's a seamlessness associated with it. But, but I still think that the models that we see in other countries will actually leapfrog uh, some of the experiences just because of our infrastructure here 
that, that already exists. Any, any other comments? Yeah. Oh. Sorry about that. All right, you guys have me back? Um, I'll uh, lean on some experience when I was my previous role when I was Chief Commercial Officer, Doctor on Demand. Um, it's the U.S.'s largest video medicine provider, so basically see a doctor on your phone and in two to three minutes. And um, we were at this really interesting crossroads between providing care, so we're literally providing patients doctor visits, and being a consumer experience, right? You had to download our app. What, what did we talk about? We talked about our net promoter score, which was in the 70s, the same as Apple, uh, you know, same as the iPhone and Amazon. Um, you know, we measured how many star ratings we had, you know, we had uh, in, in, in the app stores, et cetera, right? So we internally and to our investors ha had, uh, had the mindset of like, we treat our patients like consumers and we wanna give them an experience that is as good as their iPhone or, or their Amazon experience and that's what we benchmarked ourselves against. Now behind the scenes, it was an incredibly rigorous clinical grade infrastructure. So we knew exactly the prescribing rates of every type of drug of all the docs on our platform. We showed data on how often we did antibiotics versus, you know, versus the gold standard. You know, we knew all the data about flu season and what was happening in our population. We were doing EMR integrations into people's you know, sort of physical care structures and stuff, right? So um, it's finding, I think, those pockets of places that um, you can literally reinvent or start from scratch. And I think looking at other countries is a great example of, of, of where you're doing that. And in this case, you know, in the US, we didn't have sort of legacy telemedicine infrastructure. So we got to, you know, we got to start fresh because of, of obviously what was happening with connectivity and, and camera driven smartphones and, and everything else. So, um, but even then it was really hard. People, th you know, they have really ingrained behaviors about health. And we would get somebody who would love us for one use case. They would say, I had the flu, I used Doctor in Demand, it was amazing. And that same person, um, the, a family member gets pink eye, a child gets pink eye a week later, and they wouldn't think of Doctor in Demand. They would say, I need to call the pediatrician's office, even though that is the absolute most classic use case for video medicine, because you say, you got pink eye, your prescription's waiting at Walgreens. By the way, that hypothetical customer was my wife. Right? But it just sort of speaks to the fact that she, married to me, very educated, very smart, very experienced, didn't translate one amazing use case experience she had to a completely different use case with the same technology, right? And that sort of speaks to the challenge. It was really eye-opening to me around how do you get people to change right. behavior. So each of you gets 30 seconds. Uh, lightning round, we'll start with Sam. What is it that you didn't say that you doggone wish you had? Or what did you say that you love so much you wanted to say it again? And I'll, I'll repeat something, uh, which is, I think the digital infrastructure is really in service of getting to a personalization. That that is what's going to create the value. It is what now people are starting to get into. So, for example, when payers say that let's have a value-based contract, suddenly there's a, there's a real example. A pharma company, in essence, said. Let's make sure that our medicines go to the people who are going to see the most benefit because we're getting measured. Yeah. Um, so I'll finish what I started. I mean, I think that digital health, especially when it comes to the pharma industry, um, can be internally very complicated because it's introducing a new system, uh, a new kind of, there is a whole learning curve for this, uh, for this industry before we can bring it to the market. But in the end, when we introduce it, we need to try to do it in the most simplified and familiar way. So as a, almost as an enhanced drug uh, can be, that be consumed as a drug. So taking from the pharmacy uh, and, and keep using it uh, the, the way that you use currently a drug and get prescribed the same way as a drug and get paid in the end the same way as a drug. So really trying to simplify it for the industry to, uh, um, um, to use it um, and, and not trying to invent it first at the beginning a new way to introduce it, introduce it to the market. I'll make a prediction about, um, about digital health product development. So we have it on video so we can go back in five to seven years and see. Hold, hold me to this. So, you know, I've been around pharma long enough where I remember uh, even biologics companies, they had, they thought about drugs. And then a, and the physical device was an afterthought. It was literally a group that sat somewhere else or was outsourced, you know, sort of outsourced partner. And then they're like, so what if somebody injects themselves three times, three times a day to get the drug? The drug works. It doesn't work that anymore. You have the device groups integrated day one when you're doing the, you know, when you're starting early with the innovation because they're thinking about formulation, they're thinking about the drug delivery device, they're thinking about all of that stuff, right? So fundamentally, you develop the product, drug, and device together, right? 
That is what's going to happen to digital in the next five or seven years. Yeah. It's not going to be this yeah. afterthought. It's not going to yeah. be a group like yeah. Yick Hills, yeah. independent. It's going to be that, that product development team, whatever it's called in, in your company. On day one, when you're starting the innovation, you have the drug, you have the device expert, you have the digital expert thinking from day one around what is this product? Because the product isn't a drug, and it's not a device, and it's not digital. It's all of those things together. That was very clear. Thank the panel, please. <laughs> Terrific.